I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar um, this afternoon on combustible dust. This is Rich Barkham, uh, owner of Cardinal Compliance Consultants. Um, would like to just let everybody know that I have everybody muted just to cut down on background noise. If you have any questions, please type those in your chat box and I will um, get those answered as soon as we possibly can. Um, if you have a, a need or if you have a, if you need the, uh, the the safety credits for the Ohio Bureau of Workers Compensation, please email me at rich at cardinalhs.net and I will make sure that we get you a course participation um, certificate. And with that, I am going to turn you over to Mr. Tom Hamstreet. Tom is an electrical engineer with um, Cardinal Compliance with over 43 years of experience in manufacturing and safety. Um, and with that, Tom, it's all yours. Thank you, Rich. Today's topic is combustible dust. It's a, a little bit different of a type subject because it isn't out there at every facility, but if you're handling materials, solids, that you are granulating, if you're cutting, if you're sawing, if you're generating dust, then this issue is very important to you. Right now, OSHA looks at this as part of the general duty clause to provide a hazard-free worksite they are working on combustible dust as a standard, but it's a very tough issue to get their arms around. They've been kicking it around for a while. Fortunately, we have some NFPA guidelines that'll walk us through this complex subject. We've known about this for about 230 years. We blew up a bakery in Italy because of flour dust being touched off by a lamp. So it's not a new problem. It has been around a long time, and we're just working on trying to approach this in the proper manner. When you're manufacturing, you may create dust from what you're doing. You could be grinding, shredding, uh, processing, or you could have storage tanks or other areas that are not in the mainstream of your manufacturing that collects dust because you don't look in there all the time. Buildups of dust happen on slippery on, on rough surfaces or surfaces that have oil or maybe a corn starch or a sticky liquid, and all of a sudden you get a large buildup because once you start the dust buildup, it seems to grow rather fast. If you're sawing, cutting, if you're working with any of these types of materials, agricultural products. Uh, it's unbelievable how big of a hazard some of these can be. Uh, as we step down the line here, metal products such as aluminum and magnesium are an extremely aggressive combustible dust and need to be looked after. Uh, sometimes when we're doing other manufacturing, uh, you need to look at it, you need to make sure if you're in any of these types of manufacturing facilities or this type of business, obviously grain elevators where you're moving grain around, uh, generating a lot of dust. Many of the grain elevators uh, use pneumatic transport these days and create a bit of dust as they move material from one silo to another. Food production, uh, traditionally, uh, our materials come in on tanker truck now, pneumatically transported into large material holding bins. Uh, and with that, you have to be careful of the dust cloud and the buildup of dust that happens from that. Uh, other facilities, such as woodworking, and the finer you make the dust, the bigger the problem. So when you're turning and, and sawing and creating relatively large chips, it's not as big of a problem as you may be into when you're doing planing and or you're doing sanding and final finishing prior to some sort of a painting or top coat, that's where you generate the small particulate of the dust, which is more sensitive to being touched off or becoming a combustible dust issue. Uh, same thing with the different materials of the metals we talked about, magnesium and aluminum being pretty bad uh, in terms of their combustibility and explosive explosivity. Iron is moderately bad. It's at 1.3, 
Uh, it has to be handled properly, but handled properly, that's not that big of a deal. Some people are still using coal-fired power plants or combustible materials for generation of power or steam, and you need to be careful when you process those if you aren't creating a lot of dust that cause problems. Fortunately, with the revision of the SDS system that's happened, we now have the ability to get warned in Section 2, this may form combustible dust. So they tell you what could happen, and it's a good first check for you as a manufacturer. Look at your SDS sheets of the materials you're working with and see if, right from the start if you have a problem and if you need to get into that to understand how bad is it. Well, unfortunately, if it's not controlled properly and handled properly, you can end up with deflagration, that huge fireball that walks through your facility and causes massive damage and or loss of property and, and heaven forbid, loss of life. But in the right situation, that combustible dust turns in or could be an explosion. And these two can be interrelated. You could start with a fire that sets off an explosion when it gets to the right area, or the explosion can set out the fireball and that can burn the rest of the facility down, setting off the other dust uh, in lower concentrations. The difference that you see here is it takes five steps or five positions, five conditions to cause the explosion. Much like the oxidation or the, or the burning, we need the accelerant, we need the combustible dust itself or the fuel. We need the oxygen to burn for the rapid oxidation and the creation of heat and expansion of gases. We need that ignition source to set it off and to get the combustion going. Now, either that is how you get the fire started. But unfortunately, if that fire is then controlled in, uh, in an environment such that the gases can expand, you create a much more rapid expansion and that leads to your explosion. These materials from step number one, that is what are you handling, take a look at this and see if you have materials that fall into these categories. Like I said, please check and refer to your SDS sheets to see if handling, processing, working with these materials can cause combustible dust. Almost everybody's got oxygen out in their manufacturing floor. Uh, there may be a few processes where you're in a airtight chamber, uh, possibly in a vacuum. Sometimes I've seen nitrogen introduced to make sure that they have a safe atmosphere, uh, especially if you're mixing or blending chemicals that are sensitive to oxidation. Uh, sometimes you have uh, a system in there that keeps the oxygen out, but more than likely, some of this dust can get away from you, can leak out, it becomes airborne, and that's the worst thing. All of a sudden, it's in the middle of a, a large amount of oxygen and can touch off. What starts it? Well, it can be something as simple as static electricity, lightning, or we can generate those sparks. Sometimes they're unintentional from a loose wire. Sometimes it could be from placing the wrong kind of motor in an atmosphere where you have some combustibility or explosive dust, some of the DC motors with their brushes can set, right, can set off quite a large uh, fireball if you're using the wrong type of motor. Uh, also, there can be mechanical action that sets off the fire, matches and lighters and such, or sparks from friction as bearings go bad. Uh, they can set off sparks, grinding, and of course, welding and cutting. You don't want to bring ignition sources to a potential combustible dust area. Friction is a high heat generation, and that too, it can raise the temperature of the dust to its ignition point, and it just sets off because it got warm enough to kick over and start burning. We've got an animation here that kind of shows as we are feeding a system and drying a material, on how this could flow through and start a fire. 
oops, excuse the thick thumb for the operator, but what would happen is in the dryer, uh, we get started, and there's usually some sort of a heating source in here. It can be electrical through cartridge heaters. It could be a flame driven through, I'm sorry, through natural gas or propane or oil, and you've got a hot spot to create the elevated temperature to dry materials up. Well, dust being dust collects everywhere. And if you get that buildup of dust on those heat exchanger tubes, you could build the temperature hot enough that that hot fireball that drops off of the heating point through your piping into the additional processing, it moves through your system and moves through your system until it gets to that final blue dust collector there on the right. And that spark, that fireball, sets off that entire chamber. Why? Because we're collecting the dust in your dust collector so you could get airborne concentrations that definitely will set off into a fireball and or possible explosion. So we need to be careful. There are a lot of good design criteria to make sure that you've got the right kind of system so that if something does happen, you minimize it and you control it and it doesn't turn out to be one of those horrendous front page accidents that we see from time to time. On our way to cause an explosion is the dispersion. We need the right amount of dust up in the air that can be set off and you now have the next fourth step done for the explosion. One, two, and th I'm sorry, one, two, three, and four, that is material that burns, oxygen, an ignition source, and enough material definitely causes the deflagration or the fire. Step five, if you have it confined, and most of us do, we are manufacturing inside. If we have large enough amounts of dust, the building can't control or contain a large explosion. The windows are going to go, the ceiling could go, the roof could go, the walls can go, and there's definitely a lot of examples of that happening. Sometimes it's contained within our processing equipment, the mixing, venting chambers, the blending chambers, uh, and we have smaller tanks. Uh, all of a sudden, it's easier to get higher concentrations in a confined space like that. Getting even smaller as you move through the duct and the piping system to move or pneumatically transport your material, these can become areas of confinement where the explosion could start if you meet all five criteria. And of course, your dust collection system, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to concentrate that dust, control it, and get it out of our manufacturing site. These are some pictures of what happens when all five of those criteria are met. It can be rather violent, uh, and you definitely want to understand what you have so you can take the proper design steps and engineering methods to minimize its impact. And I'm going to try and call In the wood manufacturing plant, where these conditions are present, the destructive power is potentially enormous. of a wood manufacturing processing plant and how one small spark sets off a fire, sets off an explosion, and in destroys the, the entire facility. Sometimes with proper venting, we can move this explosion, this fireball, to a place where it minimizes the damage. Traditionally, it's outside. Uh, you want to make sure that you've thought about this. How do you contain it? Uh, you want to be careful that you're not bringing a lit fuse to another large area of combustible materials because sometimes these sequences set off one another. A small explosion in a plant can shake and vibrate the plant. Dust that's trapped in the rooster in the roof rafters starts to fall. And as that falls, if there's enough dust up there, you just went from a fireball to an explosive atmosphere and you just set the entire facility into one gigantic explosion. How do we worry, how do we get into this? How do we understand it? Well, there's some testing that we can do. And 
one of the big things we look for is the minimum explosive concentration. That is how much dust in the air that you need to set off the explosion. Now, the smaller the particles, that means, if you remember your chemistry class, that you have a lot uh, quicker chemical reaction. So typically, smaller size leads to more explosive uh, atmospheres and or uh, conditions. Also, if the product has more caloric content, in it, that is, more combustibility, more things that can oxidize, it becomes rather rampant rather quickly. Uh, Cornstarch, from the agricultural side, some from grain products can be really bad. And these are very light products. They want to suspend in air and become a big problem. Here's some rough classifications of our dust. Uh, obviously, the, you can see the K value in the middle up in the dark blue. That's the measurement of how explosive this is, how rapid the expansion, how much uh, air gets displaced in the, in the uh, explosion. We've got basically three categories to worry about. Uh, number one, weak to moderate. That's from one to 200 on the K value. K values of a little over 200 up to 300 are really quite strong explosions. And anything with K values over 300 are extremely violent explosions and really need to be looked at, and as do all of these, to make sure that you don't have undesirable results. Here's a few typical K values for some of the things that are out there in industry. You can see we've got something as simple as coal dust, which we all know burns, but it's only got a K value of 85. It's bad. Uh, a little above that would be the milk powder. Uh, there again, caloric, it's got lactose, it's got sugars in there, it's got some starches, it's got a fair bit to lead off into combustion. Then as you move into the other agricultural products, we're up in the mid 200s. So it's getting pretty bad. And then down at the bottom, I held the two metals, magnesium and aluminum powder, as I said, can be extremely violent and really need to be watched as you manufacture and process these items. Remember, OSHA is looking out for combustible dust. They may come into your facility for a potential violation. You may be on one of those nice hit lists where OSHA comes in from time to time and checks your manufacturing system to make sure that you're doing things okay. They may be in on a follow-up. If you've been cited before, they wanna make sure things are running right. And when they do a walkthrough, if they see a buildup of dust that's thicker than a dime, that's OSHA's basically dust meter. If it's thicker than a dime, then OSHA is going to be triggered into, I think we need to take a look at this. They may make a call back and come in and take a sample of your dust, and they're going to define for themselves whether it's combustible. If it is, they're going to cite you. Now, if you can say, I'm already on top of this, I've tested my dust, I've analyzed this, and here's my dust control program, then they're gonna go like, great, that's exactly what we had in mind. That's what you want to have. These are some of the NFPA guidelines and regulations to help understand combustible dust. As I said, it's not an easy topic and it's spread across several different NFPA regulations. And then of course spills over into the National Electric Code because you can have airborne dust that would be class two. And then you have enough dust that the airborne cloud is explosive, that would be group one. And then if you have enough dust that could be potentially become airborne, you got group two, and then the dust can be further refined into different subcategories depending on what it is. So there's a lot of different standards and guidelines that you need to understand how to put in a safe system. Also, combustible dust can violate other regulations of OSHA. Well, you know, dust like flour uh, could become rather slippery or make walking working surfaces a hazard. Uh, if you've got the possibility of combustible dust, you want to make sure that your emergency action plans, your fire prevention plans, and your exit routes are well marked. Uh, too much dust in the air can be a real problem for human lungs. Uh, when you're inside those bins doing repair of the agitators, the pumps, the level probes, uh, when they enter the confined space, 
there's this extra hazard of combustible dust. Those people need to be notified and on their game to handle that properly. Uh, depending on what type of material you have, you want the right type of, of portable fire extinguishers and alarm system to let people know this place is on fire and you want to have a preset plan on what to do uh, if something becomes ignited and the fire gets out of control. Um, when you generate the dust, hopefully you've got a dust collecting system or <laughs> you're sweeping it up, what do you do with it? How do you handle it? How do you ship it? Uh, is this an area where industrial trucks, JLGs, fork trucks can go through? Could the hot uh, exhaust system or the hot motor set something off? You need to take a look at that, understand your dust to make sure that you've got the right type of equipment for your particular application. As I said before, some motors have brushes. You want to make sure you have the right type of electrical equipment in there. Uh, it also affects the hazardous locations, subpart S for electrical, and some of the metals, many of the metal dust, can become toxic. And if you're into pharmaceutical manufacturing, you know, traditionally, we're taking milligrams for our doses. And when you're around dust, you could be exposed to way more concentration to that over time than what a doctor might prescribe, or it could absolutely be the wrong medication for you and cause serious medical problems. So some of the areas that can cause problems with dust. How do you start it? Well, check your SDS sheets. Okay, it could be, that's what it says. Now, how do you know? You need to find the right lab. There's quite a few here in the country. Not all of them are qualified because dust is kind of a weird topic. It needs a special certification to make sure that they understand the properties and tests. There's as many as 12 different tests or classifications for combustible dust. Don't start with all 12, please. Start at a simple level of all three of these uh, tests listed, and it's kind of a pass-fail system. If you don't have a combustible dust issue as defined by these first three, your testing costs can be relatively small, maybe $500 a sample. If you have to go through all 12 tests, your testing costs could be well in excess of $5,000 per material or per test. So kind of do it as a step process, a pass-fail. Do I have a problem? How big is the problem? How sensitive is the problem? And these labs are very good to work with. They'll tell you or indicate to you where the best place is to look for dust, where the traditional problems have been in industry. They'll tell you how to take the sample, how to package it, make sure that you know where it came from so that when they give you the results, you know what dust sample was taken from which area to help in your analysis and making sure you reduce your hazards. Uh, also, when shipping this, you may run into some transportation issues. They'll work with you to get the thing properly packaged so it can be shipped without problems. Uh, it is the best way to go, work with the pros in the business, and they're, they're usually quite good. They'll give you the data, they're certified, and they too have a, uh, a vested interest. They want to certify the test. So they're going to work with you to make sure that the tests are coming to them, uh, which is representative of what you have. The NFPA 499 is a great guideline after you find out you have a combustible dust and you get the K value and a couple other values. You can go into this and it'll help you quantify, well, what could this combustible dust do to my facility? What could happen? Well, if you have it in enough airborne concentration, it could become an explosion. Remember those five Pentagon items that could lead to an airborne explosion. You could have enough that it's a relatively small explosion, and what would it do to the facility? Depending on its K value and how many kilograms of dust you have in the facility, it'll tell you what kind of damage that that rapid expansion, that explosion will do to your building. It may be something as simple as blowing out a window, or it could be a, so severe that the only thing left standing is the structural steel. 
also it tells you to sample and look at the hidden dust, the dust up in the rafters. Why is that important? Because if something were to upset that, and we're getting into that windy season now where we get these violent thunderstorms, we've had our doors closed uh, all winter long, dust may have built up in the rafters, and you get a big thunderstorm that comes through with a big gust of wind, and that dust gets displaced and falls down, and traditionally you never have a dust cloud, but when that big gust of wind came through, you generated one. That's another great provision to work with 499. Then also in 499, it handles the explosion type of issues, and then it gets into the combustibility, the fire, how much fire damage, and how many pounds or kilograms of material are in your facility, and what it's gonna take and what it would do to the facility. It's a great guideline, um, a little tough to work with, but they really do a, a good job of helping you understand what combustible dust can do to your facility. NFPA 654 also does a good job of if, when you have it, what type of equipment? How do you engineer it? How do you work with a good system to minimize your hazards with dust? It tells you to look around. Dust is really kind of a, an elusive creature. As you know, you might see it in the sunlight floating around. In the manufacturing world, it finds its way into those closets, the second floor mezzanines, storage shelves where you may not access all the time, or you get up above a drop ceiling. This comes from the real world out on the East Coast. Uh, it was a pharmaceutical manufacturer that made pills and put them into bottles and into cartons and shipped them out. And of course, they made pills of all different types, all different sizes, all different quantities. So they had flex, flexible cell manufacturing, that is different types of machines and machinery that they could come in, plug in from overhead drop cords and run that day's batch. Well, over the years, the dust that was generated accumulated not in the clean room, but above the clean room on a drop ceiling. And flexible cords being what they are, they got a little bit worn. One day there was an arc, there was a short in that cord, the short and the, and the uh, electrical spark rose up the cord, got above the drop ceiling, and the only thing left was the structural steel. Here's another example of what electrical issues are with dust. You can see the large dust buildup on the top of these two push button stations. 499 helps you understand and quantify this. There's a couple of big issues with this. Uh, also, there's the fire uh, prevention, housekeeping that needs to be looked at, and combustible dust built up around electrical devices is a big problem. Here's an example of, if you take a look on the left, there's a large disconnect switch and you can see the buildup of dust up on top of the switch. That's a huge problem. When OSHA does the walkthrough, yes, she may have combustible materials in there, but you haven't let it build up on the top of panels as shown on the right. Now, what's the problem with all that dust over there on that disconnect switch on the left? Well, it's a couple, three things. One is the dust on the top of that is much like the dust that's trapped in the rafters. When you open that panel, some of that dust can fall off and become airborne. And all of a sudden, there was no cloud, boom, now you created that dust cloud and you've got an explosive uh, pentagon completed, and that is a real problem. Also, that dust could be just ignited from a hot temperature, like we talked about in our process equipment. We generate a fair bit of heat in some of our electrical panels, and if your dust has a relatively low ignition point, uh, an elevated temperature from your control panels, not so much, but control circuit transformers, power transformers, they get quite warm, and those can touch off the more sensitive uh, combustible dust, and then it starts and it gets carried away. And you can see from that real-world example, there, there's a lot of material that could become part of a secondary fire. Or 
as we talked about the electrical causing the dust, your process can cause those airborne dust clouds. You could be filling, you could be packaging, you could be grinding, and you put a large amount of dust into the air. You really got to take a look at that and understand the characteristics of your dust cloud, knowing what it can do. You want to come up with the right systems and controls to make sure that you provide uh, minimum hazards to your workers. When you work with NFPA 654, it does a nice job of telling you how to work with this, how to approach it, what type of equipment, what you need to be as a, a diligent employer in terms of how often do I need to inspect, how often do I need to test, what's my housekeeping standards, what are my written program for dust. And please remember some of these dust issues cross over into other OSHA categories. So it's not just the control of dust, it needs to get into possibly lockout tagout conditions and into confined space. When you collect the dust, please don't use an air blowdown. Uh, you don't want to create a dust cloud that could become potentially combustible or explosive. Use the proper type of, of vacuuming systems. Train your people. I know it's an old time, old school thing of using an air hose to blow down but you're taking a solid layer of dust, making it airborne and raising the hazard level. So make sure that your people are trained and they understand what they're doing uh, because all of a sudden you could have changed your electrical category. There's no combustible dust cloud and you have equipment set up for that. Now you've generated a cloud and a spark can set it off and boom, you've got the explosion. The proper type of vacuum systems would be for the class two combustible dust, Division One, uh, which uh, has the groups of E, F, and G. You can consult the National Electric Code. It'll tell you exactly what those are. And because of the different types of materials, uh, organics and metal dust and things like that, there are a couple little different nuances to handling each one of those. Uh, they do make some wonderful dust collecting systems with the HEPA filters and they do a, a wonderful job of collecting it and containing it and getting your facility back under a, uh, an explosive limit. And really the, the right way to go about this is good housekeeping. If you've got a well-designed engineering system that has the ability to keep the dust from being generated or you control it, uh, a little bit gets away. Well, why? Because every now and then you've got to get into that tank or you've got to get into the process. You have to do some cleaning. And so you've got the runagate dust that happens and the dust will settle out. So you need to take a look at how well can I clean this, how much dust can accumulate before it becomes a hazard, and set the appropriate trigger points. Uh, maybe your dust is such that an eighth of an inch becomes a combustible hazard then you want to set your frequency standards of cleaning at maybe a sixteenth of an inch to allow yourself a little safety factor that if some guy on one shift kind of skips over it, you still might be safe. But uh, set up workable limits that keep your facility in good shape. And when OSHA walks in, if they see a well-organized, uh, clean facility, it doesn't raise their level of attention as much of when they walk in, they go like, oh my, what are all these crazy things hanging from the lights and, and what is this dust and I don't know what it is. You're setting off a bunch of bells and whistles that uh, uh, you may not want to go down that road. As I said, combustible dust needs to hand or be in your other programs and regulations, hot work permits. Obviously, if you've got an accumulation of, hot, of, of combustible dust, Welding and grinding and, and uh, cutting needs to be really looked at. There are certain conditions before you ever allow welding in an area of combustible dust. Uh, you want to get that cleaned up before to make sure that some action, like maybe hanging a new fire extinguisher bracket, sets and blows up the entire facility. Your lockout tagout policies, that's really important for the people that have flexible cell manufacturing. When you bring in a new piece of equipment, traditionally it's plugged in. 
it gets to a couple areas. Those sparks can set off the dust, and sometimes the dust can build up on the cord, and all of a sudden you've got kind of like a lit fuse of dust going up to the rafters or a horizontal surface where the dust may have accumulated. Uh, the other issue is you may generate a cloud of dust when you shake that cord and when you unplug it, if it's still energized, your spark then completes the pentagon of an explosivity and the dust in the air with the spark of the plug sets it off and you have a problem. Train your electricians, your qualified people, that when they're in the panels around electrical panels, they have several things they need to look at. Opening the door without cleaning the dust off the panel can create that dust cloud. Make sure that they clean that before they ever open the door on an electrical control panel. Also, if there is an airborne cloud of dust, uh, don't let them open those panels uh, unless the panel has been designed for that type application. It may be designed uh, for not a dust cloud, and if there is one, uh, you have real problems in there. And just something as simple as doing your electrical lockout, tagout, and doing the live dead live test you know, with the use of the voltmeter, He's up there checking for electricity and all of a sudden a little spark gets generated and we have a big problem. And as I said before, be careful of the heat buildup on the panels. You may raise your dust to the combustible limits. Be careful how you store this. Um, you know, you may generate a little dust or an awful lot of dust. Be careful of the magnitude of that hazard. Uh, you may want to schedule more frequent removal times minimum storage size or maximum storage size to minimize uh, the potential hazard. Uh, look at your policies and procedures for cleaning, design of your equipment, and what can you do to minimize the spread of the fire. Make sure you have your emergency action plan updated for handling any such contingency that could happen and let people know what's going on. Keep your fire extinguishers fresh and fully charged. Make sure you have the right type of extinguisher, have your cleanup policies in practice and enforce them. Do the walkthrough. That's a hazard that left unattended will get worse. So you need to be diligent on this. You need somebody walking through to make sure that the cleaning is being done properly. Uh, obviously having first aid kits and, and the other actions that uh, good employers do only help your work site and reduce the hazard. You need to cross-train. You need the operators to understand that when you open this door, there could be a dust cloud in there you're letting out. And you have to be careful of that. This is what could happen. You need people that when they go into confined space, flour bins, cornstarch bins, uh, that when they enter that confined space, you have to be very careful because there is the element of an explosion and or a fire in there depending on what they're doing. So your, your confined, space, confined space people need to be trained. Also your electrical people, your qualified people, they need to be brought up to speed on that to make sure they don't accidentally set off that fireball. And you're better off having everyone in the facility kind of being your watchdog. Let them know that that accumulation of dust can be a real problem that you're trying to control it, and it's your intention to provide a good, clean, safe workplace. I'll see if I can handle a few questions right now. If anybody has any questions, please um, please let us know. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, it looks like we have no questions for you, Tom. Okay. This means you did a really good job then. <laughs> um, with that, um, if you do have any questions, um, afterwards you can get a hold of Tom at T Hamstreet, at T is in Tom, H A M S T R E E T, at cardinalhs.net. Um, we'd like you to take a look on the screen right now, um, get an idea of some of the um, additional webinars that we have coming up. We do have an open enrollment class on May 16th, which is next Wednesday, at Northwest State Community College. Um, to do a, a deeper dive into combustible dust. This is an issue that um, has been 
a little bit confounding to a lot of employers. It's a highly technical issue, very hard to understand, uh, which is why we had Tom speaking about it today instead of myself. Um, if you are interested in that, you can go to our website at www.cardinalhs.net and see about getting signed up for that. Cost for that class is $89. However, if you're a uh, member of the Black Swamp Safety Council, um, a member of the Manufacturers Extension Program through Northwest State, a um, member of the Employers Association, or a member of the uh, Perrysburg Chamber of Commerce, um, let us know and you can get a discounted rate of $59 per um, attendee, which is a really good value for a four-hour class. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end our um, presentation today. And I appreciate um, everybody paying attention. If you would like a certificate of attendance uh, for Ohio uh, BWC um, purposes, um, please email me at rich at cardinalhs.net. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.